Hey everyone, welcome to this fantastic interview episode of the Electronic Cafe. Mark and I have just had the good fortune and absolute pleasure to talk to uh, Rob Marshall, aka Humanist, uh, who's just brought out his new album, On the Edge of a Lost and Lonely World. Mate, what a lovely guy. I'm a little bit speechless after that. Yeah, well, don't, don't, don't be both <laughs> That conversation we had with him, because it was just a phenomenal chat. I mean, you know, Dave Garm, Mark Lanigan, just Soul Savers, Depeche Ed Harper, Harper, just, Mark Gardner. I mean, yeah, every, everything's in there. I mean, you know, he's a really nice guy, really talented guy, phenomenal musician, and I, I am a little bit speechless. So I'll be really um urge people to to watch this episode yeah 100 percent, 100 percent, and not just because he's a lovely guy which is but also his his body of work is just incredible and this and this new album if you haven't heard it is amazing you know it really is and um you know you guys probably know that mr gahan appears on the track but as do several so many other good artists so really recommend that you check it out if you haven't done so already and yeah meet the guy that so Mark and I just spent the last hour talking to was, you know, one of the nicest people you could ever wish to meet. Well, I don't think it's because the records are not, they're not, um, any good. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, uh, mm. on the electronic cafe today, off the back of his brilliant and I think the latest release on the edge of the lost and lonely world, we are really buzzing that Rob Marshall, aka Humanist, is here. Rob, welcome to Electronic Cafe, my friend. It's so good to have you here, and congrats on that oh. your latest release. Absolutely amazing, and a critical acclaim we're seeing on your on some of your socials. I mean, it's, every music magazine is going nuts about it. You must be delighted. Oh, I am, yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh... You always hope that those that the the good reviews come in, but you never. There's no guarantees in anything in the world, you know. But uh, yeah. but if, as long as you believe in the music, that I like to say that I don't care about that stuff, and I don't up until the album comes out, and then I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been really good, really good. Yeah, and, exactly. and that, so, look, for people who haven't seen this or got this, it, we, I mean, we've heard me and Mark play it a few times, and I mean, it's just. It's a real journey album as well, I think, in terms of texture, feel, you know, the, it's just amazing. And, and look, thinking about you as an individual, I mean, they're talking about critical acclaim. I mean, was it Guitarist Magazine hailed you as one of the best guitar, British guitarists in the last 25 years? They don't say that yeah. about many people, mate. So you've obviously got an incredible yeah. talent and you must be pleased when you get that kind of, again, that extra feedback. It must be brilliant. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I mean, all that stuff you've got to take ton in cheek, but... Um... Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, it's, I've, I've I've been lucky mainly. I think probably because the, the a decade of being in a band before this, sure, where uh, we really stuck to our guns and uh, and did exactly what we wanted to do and built a kind of reputation of being client, kind of slightly building a, a kind of left left field kind of cult audience, and that has continued on into what. I do really in the people that I choose to work with and I've been very lucky what can I say you know you'll probably shoot me now but I discovered Exit Calm yesterday and oh. I, I was listening to the second album um the future album and yeah. I just couldn't believe how, how good it was and how I'd missed it I mean it was acclaimed by I think you had Liam Gallagher liked it and like the, the guys from Verve liked it you know, you came from a sort of similar sort of region. And I was listening to that album yesterday and I was thinking, fuck me, this is unbelievable. <laughs> really unlucky really? with that album. It is so underrated. So 
that, that was the second one. The first one, which was the, it's going through some kind of, um, I don't know, remastering of some kind, and it's not online at the moment. But that was the kind of one. The first record was the one that kind of put us, a, 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 you know, it, I mean, it's a very small map, but put us on the map in terms of uh, building those kind of audiences. But we were we were loved by bands a lot, you know. We like like you said that you know we, we ended up touring with Bunny Man and and Doves. And yeah. you know the, the, a lot of you know the music and soul uh, soul service for a um, bit, and you know we we kind of really built a, a very small but cool audience. Like the Chameleons, for example, from Manchester, Dave yeah, yeah. and Reg were big fans of the band, and yeah, and that kind of so we were tapping into that audience, and that's the kind of the thing that I've always done, really. Mm. So uh, even with this, it, it's the, the the thing that I'm kind of going for is that Bunny Men, Killing Joe, Bauhaus. You know, yeah, yeah. it's kind of it's those kind of like because when you when you, I think the people that love those records, they, they they stay with you for life. They follow you through, like the you know Depeche Mode, yeah. obviously a large on a large scale that, but um, but the smaller ones, you know, they're they're so the, the, things like the Chameleons, such an important band. Mm. Yeah, they weren't massive, you know what I mean. But there's yeah. people that will never that will never not play those records. It'll, it'll up the down escalator, what a track that is! From yeah, Chris. I mean, for yeah. Not, I mean, you mentioned also Soul Savers. I mean, you're ticking all of our boxes here because it's all stuff, everything. <laughs> it's all you know, it's all music we like. I mean, it's um, you're you're right. I mean, people will like those those bands do stick with it forever. I was living in Sheffield uh, for a long time and um, I hadn't really heard of the Chameleons going back about probably about 20 years. And my friend was, uh, he was like, oh, he phoned me up. He was like, what are you doing tonight? I said, oh, nothing. He said, I'll go down to this place called the Casbah. There's a guy called Mark Burgess doing an acoustic gig down there. He was the singer in the Chameleons. And, yeah. uh, and I went down and... It was it was it was so good. But he just did an acoustic gig. He was quite he was quite nervous as well. You could see he was kind of a little bit on the on the back foot. But yeah, he op he opened up with um, time. What struck me was the there was probably only about forty or fifty people there, but they were like all kind of together like a family of of, of, of the audience that everybody knew yeah. each other, and they were willing him on, and they you know people were. were leather jackets of the chameleons and studs on the back of the jacket you know and stuff and like it, it, it was just a, such a charge of energy in the room yeah nice. and uh i was just like well fuck it was so it was so good to see yeah it never left me because it was the devotion i think of it wasn't yeah. really watching mark sing the songs but it was watching the audience and him become one and them all singing along together and I, I, it was very rare that I'd, I'd seen that before, and I've never forgotten it since. You know, eighteen amazing. years, whatever. House of Love, House of Love was another band like that as well. Yeah, but amazing band. You know, again, like the what I loved about House of Love, especially when um, Terry was involved in them, is that like you'd have these moments of like madness where Terry would just kind of t t he could be almost like this statue figure. For like half an hour and then suddenly it's like something just erupted in him and he's running and charging around this the stage and just insane those things that like Brilliant. send the hairs up on your arms and then again yeah. the massive significant moments that uh on the live spectrum that never leave me and what i what i aim to try and do is always get that in every gig which yeah, is yeah, yeah. whether that's a possibility or not but i you know i, I never forget those things on a hand on maybe one or two hands i can look back on all the years of seeing stuff live, and there's just a handful of things that I go, and they're just, and they're not full gigs; they're just minutes, but they've changed my life. Going right back, when when did you first pick up a guitar, mate? I mean, was it as an early is it child or something you discovered later in life? When did you start? I picked it up about fourteen or fifteen, and um, I've told this story a few times, but I'll, I'll do it quickly. But essentially, my uh, parents at the time would 
down on the luck and struggling financially and um and a guitar for me was something that was untouchable it was on top of the pops and, sure. and especially being in the area that i was in i didn't know anybody that was a musician i didn't know anybody who played guitar and, and um and then one day i was looking for the argos catalog and i saw one in the back of the argos catalog and it was like 129 quid or something it was leading up to christmas and uh my mum and dad couldn't afford to buy me a guitar, but they, uh, whatever happens, even if my mum and dad had no food, there would always be an, uh, for £1.50 for me and my brother to basically throw dinner money and for our bus fare. And I walked to and from school for a couple of months and I saved up, I didn't eat on my dinner and I saved up all the money that I had wow. and gave it to my mum for Christmas and to get a guitar, basically. So wow. I think because it was such a because I wanted it so much, it was yeah, the first yeah, yeah. time I'd seen something that that, that I I was obsessing over and the idea of it. And as soon as I got it, although I wasn't very good at it, you know, I, it felt alien just putting it on my leg or even holding it right, you know. But I just I knew that I had to stick with it. It was something that was going to be there around for a long deep. time. And yeah, and sure that sure enough, uh, how many years later, still <laughs> still learning. Yeah, what an amazing story, though. And, and, and obviously, you know, there's something you knew you wanted that so bad. You did that, you know, walking and missing your dinner, dinner lunches. That's incredible. I, well, mean, I saw. I, I think I saw it as a way out, basically. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah, it was like a t- it was like a ticket to another world. You know, I thought yeah. if I if I kind of I knew that it would, I had some kind of like weird obsession with it, and I just kind of thought if I get you know if I can if I can work out how to bloody play this then it might lead it might find me a, i don't know you know what i mean an opportunity somewhere yeah. online to to leave the town that i loved but i'd never felt connected with i mean at that time you know as you said you saw this stuff on top of the pots who, who were your inspirations and influences my mom said i was obsessed with adam and adam and the ants and, um, but I like to say, I think it was because of the first parents. So honestly, too, I think it was just like, <laughs> it's uh, like the pirate thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but I love the tracks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, I did. Uh, but God, I mean, uh, that was that's probably the the first significant memory. After that, a lot of shite, and then I kind of um, <laughs> fell into the court tales of the Britpop era, I guess, because my brother, who's older than me by a couple of years, um, was getting into that and. And right. I kind of was obviously influenced heavily by the things that he was listening to. So it was kind of like the 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 roses period really and right. into kind of the early oasis and stuff like Primal Screen and Massive Attack. Well, they just looked so it they they had the iconic thing down, didn't they? And that don't give a fuck attitude, which yeah. was always like very appealing back then. Obviously by the time fast forward to kind of ninety seven, ninety eight with the later oasis stuff it got was getting a bit tiring, do you know what I mean? But Agreed. Um, but it, especially, but the kind of latter part of the Roses days and the and the significant, if you like, um, definitely may, maybe period. It all felt very kind of real. Do you know what I mean? And there was a little it was bit of playing. Time. Yeah, it was. It was massive, wasn't it? You know. Yeah. You don't get it anymore, but it was. Co- and we are older than you, Rob, but I mean, we grew up in the 80s and it was all very tribal. You had your music that you loved and you had yeah. your mates that loved the same music and you dressed like that and stuff. And I suppose Britpop and grunge, I suppose, were the, probably the last two acid house, you know, whereas like now, the youngsters now haven't really got something to latch on to or, you know, um, a tribe to, to oh. call their own. Well, I just think it's because the records are not they're not um, any good. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the emphasis isn't on the album anymore. Obviously, for fossils like myself, it is. It's everything. Do you know what I mean? But um, I don't know if I don't know what the new bands are that are uh, significant. And I'm not. I don't mean bands like Idols and stuff like that. I mean 
the new bands right now and if and the kids that are kind of the generation like of this new decade that are streaming are, and stuck to phones so what are they even buy it are they looking at records i know they're not buying records but to, i don't think i think it's gone in that in sense i don't know where we're at, we're at a, a definitely a pivotal point but in 20 years time are people going to be listening to records because the people that are propping the records up of the bands like Depeche Mode still and Idols and and what, yeah. whatever Taylor Swift even you know that I don't know you know it's not my my for me but Do you know what? you both make really good points on that because Mark was saying about the tribes and stuff and you're talking about the music mate I totally agree but what's weird I mean my daughter my youngest daughter just turned twenty one but she loves electronic eighties music and, and 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 it might be because I play it a lot in the house but all her friends here and go we don't hear stuff I said actually. The newer stuff of the back of that. So some of the stuff that Mark will play or I'll play on the show, the amount of times their friends come and go, What's that playing, Andy? That sounds brilliant. I don't hear this stuff in clubs. You should be a DJ. Now I'm not going to be a DJ, <laughs> but you know, it's nice that they they're hearing it. So I I think it's because a lot of it's because they're just not hearing it. Because they're hearing, and no disrespect to Ed Sheeran and Sailor Swift, it's all, you know, they're all very tan. I'm not going to start, but it's not that original. Whereas the stuff from the eighties no. or stuff like Oasis that you mentioned was quite original and there was a flavour to it. And I just don't think there's there, there are some bands that we interview that have got that flavour, but they don't get any airplay. So you know, it's, yeah. it's so kids don't hear it, so kids don't know any better. And I, it so, is a shame because I I love that like the, the, what um, Mike was saying about the the you kind of you you, you chose your cloth really, didn't you? Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And. Um, and you couldn't. There wasn't much of a crossover, and if, if there was, it was you kept it quiet. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah, like yeah. it was, I, you know, I, it was a little bit like the Blur and Oasis thing, wasn't it? You couldn't like one without the other, really, which is ridiculous. You know what I mean? But yeah, no, it's but that doesn't happen now, does it? No. You know, there's no. not. You're not a uh, you're not an Ed Sheeran fan, and you can't be a Taylor Swift or whatever. You know, what I mean? Like, but, I mean, yeah, we. I mean, you know, we buy a lot of vinyl. I mean. Your two albums, great. We buy far too much vinyl, to be fair. I'm, I'll keep my voice down because my wife's next door, so she'll probably... Yeah, and I'll <laughs> edit, this, edit this bit out in case my wife is. But <laughs> when you buy an album, you're making a commitment to listen to an album, aren't you? You're making a commitment to listen to a body of work that the artist has written, in, which is date-stamped a period of time. It, the album is syndicated in a way that they want the tracks to go side one, side two... Whereas like now, if it's on Spotify, you're just flicking through, you listen to one song, you go somewhere else, you go somewhere else. And I think the younger generation, without sounding, trying to sound like an old fart, probably don't make the time to sit down and listen to an album yeah. from start to finish. Or an album is put together by a record label, maybe, as a series of singles. I mean, you're really lucky because, I was going to touch on this a little bit later, this album, and you just signed to Bella Union, who's one of our... Mm favorite labels and they're still putting out amazing content amazing packaging um and bella union are, are one of the ones that really do fly the flag for for vinyl releases i think no it, uh, i mean do you know what the when i started appro approaching simon i was about 80 percent 90 percent finished with the record you know you're never quite finished but um yeah but uh he was the first guy i sent the record to he's the first and the only guy i sent the record to Simon kind of just works with who he wants to work with. It's simple as that. It doesn't matter if you're huge or small. He kind of tends to, it's not really about the, you know. He does it from the heart instead of. He the, really does, actually. Yeah. yeah. I he, love he, that. he literally, I love that. Yeah, yeah. And that is very, very rare. And I knew that I just thought, oh, I, I just felt like Bella Union would be a good home for the record. So he's, I, and when I sent him the, the album, I said, I haven't sent it to anybody else. And uh, I really want to be on Bella Union. I think this record is. You know, worthy, and uh, he came back pretty much. I noticed that they, I sent a private SoundCloud link, and I noticed the, the players started to to go. And then he came back and uh, uh, said, "Yeah, I'm interested. Um, let's uh, leave. You know, get back to me in a week or something like that." And then within about a week, there was about a two hundred 
players on the SoundCloud link, which I thought was quite significant. Like, you know, and uh, there was an, it wasn't him that was just listening to it. it as a, a, I think he sent it to a few key members. One of the guys that was listening to it was a guy called Duncan, who did the, uh, who it turns out, did the press on Gargoyle and somebody's knocking two records ah. I did with Mark. So he was a fan of, uh, he was a fan of me, I guess, um, already. And so he that he was like a significant player in that as well. That he uh, that he loved the record so much, you know, and he, yeah, and he yeah. really liked the stuff that I did with Mark anyway. So it was uh, so it was kind of like once Duncan was on board with Simon, it was like it it just fell into place really. So your album is quite similar in the way, not the music, but the way it it kind of falls onto the vinyl as the Horizons album, which is on Better Union. You know, it's a series of songs with different. Oh, Lost Horizons. Different collaborate, yeah. different vocalists on on the tracks. I Is hadn't it? heard that, that. That's Simon's uh, project, yeah. basically. Yeah. And um, I didn't know anything about that, but uh, interestingly, though, we were having a conversation that he was like, "Oh, how how do you foresee touring this?" And I was like, "Well, I wanted two of the records," and um, I had these this conversation at length actually with Lanigan because he was like. On the first record, he was like, "Oh, I'm a bit worried that, like, you know, you, maybe you should just do like one gig and uh, wherever and try and get everybody." And I was like, "No, I was like, no, man. Like, if I, that, if I do that, that's the fucking end of it. Like, you know, I can do one and then it's over." I said, "Fuck, I want to, I want to tour this." Sure. Yeah. So my approach, with my approach live has always been the same way that I put the records together as a collaborative thing. Like for me to collaborate with just different singers. So it's constantly moving. And I thought if I bring the guests in from the day one, it's fucked. So I said, if I build it from the bottom where and I don't give anybody the idea that anybody's going to turn up, then it can only grow from there and people yeah. won't expect it. And then I can kind of bring in people every now and again. Exactly. And it was, you know, it was tough on that first record because I, the, because of the whole COVID thing and the whole two, I never really got a chance to, to like run with that idea. But see, what the point being is that well, I explained this to Simon. He was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's tough." Because he went, "I fucked it." I, I, in terms of he got, he did that gig, and he got everybody to turn up. And he said it, it was like one gig, and it basically cost him so much money to do it. And um, he was just kind of credit to to basically the idea of what I was trying to do is in, yeah. in terms of like you know, I th which it does feel right. You know, I've done it now. I, I went out with. Depeche Mode and, and the Jane's Addiction stuff, and it was fucking great, man. Okay. Really good, and it works. Mate, you, you mentioned about obviously the albums of uh, Mark Gargo and somebody's knocking. How, how did you meet Mark? Because I mean, again, another guy we absolutely loved. You know, amazing talent. Basically, my old manager when I first started writing the um, Humanist and putting it together, I had it like um, two or three tracks together. Mm. And she, basically, she sent an email to his old manager at the time, it was a guy called Kevin Gasser, and um, just basically, this is a brand new project and. Um, Really exciting. It's working with lots of different people, approaching different people. Here's uh, a couple of tracks we feel be right for Mark. Mark listened to them and just liked the tracks. Didn't like, you know, I had no idea who I was or anything. I actually had toured, uh, said toured, but did like maybe four or five gigs with Soul Savers, but when Lanigan was singing. Uh, but I didn't didn't speak to Mark. Mark was like kind of off limits back then. He just, I'd see him like in Manchester like backstage and no, not even the band was speaking to him. He's just sat on his own for like really? two or three hours. He just, he, first time I saw him, he was sat down and he just had his head down <laughs> and he was just like, I thought, is he asleep? Or is he looking at the floor? I don't know, man. And I walked past and uh, two hours later, I walked past and he's still in the same position, <laughs> just, just looking at the floor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just thought, and not, not, not even his band members were speaking to him, like I said, and I just thought, you know what? That guy's off limits, basically. So 
through that whole, I didn't speak to him once. And then, so he wouldn't have, he, he said he remembered the band though. Um, but he was like, fuck, because he got back to me about a year, uh, six months afterwards or something, after we worked together, and he said, fuck, you were in Exit Calm. And I said, Jenny, what, why didn't you say it? And I was like, well, I didn't feel like it was important. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. So, voice. Oh, incredible. So he sang on those tracks, and then um, I sent him an email saying thank you afterwards, and if you need ever need, if you ever want to do some more music together, I'd be totally up for it. And I uh, put in this email, you know, something like Killing Joke and some a few other things, Joy Division, that kind of thing. And then um, about, I didn't hear anything back from him. And then about two weeks after that, um, I got this email out of the blue, basically saying, oh, hey, I'm going to the studio to do this uh, record and I've got a window with uh, Alan Johannes, who was his producer at the time. And I've got this record that I've written, but I don't like it and Alan's gone off on tour with PJ Harvey for a year so I've got to get this record done in the next two in the next three weeks have you got any leftover humanist material and I was like no but I'll write something for you basically and um and then locked myself away for like a week and didn't see light you know and just kind of yeah 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 and buried myself in the music and wrote about eight tracks and sent him six or six or seven and six ended up on the record and that's how that that kind of really started our friendship really our musical journey together because then i just ended up continuing to write for him right yeah. up until he died i was still writing with him yeah amazing um, amazing death tripping through the kingdom death is riding by my side we are rolling through the kingdom ours is just to ride or die Talking of legends, obviously can't not mention Mr. Gahan. I mean, that's a, you know, obviously I know Dave and uh, Mark both works on the Soul Savers projects as well. But you know, getting Dave Gahan on your bills uh, pretty impressive as well. How, how did that happen, mate? <laughs> 